welcome, welcome. Oh, I am so overwhelmed by my Father, that He created me in such wondrous ways, that He formed me in my mother's womb. Even before I was known, He knew me. And He created us in such an amazing way. We have five incredible senses. We smell and taste and touch and hear and see. You know, that's how he has made us to behold his glorious presence. Sometimes I hear him in songs and in praise and worship. I see him in the kindnesses of people toward one another. I smell him when I get the sense of his, of his presence through the aroma of prayer and the sacrifice of praise. Sometimes I taste him when I taste his word and when he says, taste and see that the Lord is good and I can taste the honey on my lips that is the word of God. And sometimes I can just touch his glorious presence in the, in the arms or with the hand of someone. I can embrace him in all five of my senses. And, and so this study that God gave me is about one of those senses. It's this beautiful study that I just really never stopped and thought about when I read it over and over. And I read this psalm a lot. It's Psalm 51 of David. And I read it often. But this time, one word captured my heart. I mean, literally captivated me. This one word did. So let let me just start. It's called, Do You Hear What I Hear? Now, how is it that David is called a man after God's very own heart? How is it that when God is talking to Solomon, David's son, that he could say this? This is 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. And it says this, Now if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised your, to David, your father. Now, how could God make such an amazing statement, almost a bragging on who David was, when we know who David was? We know the sins that he committed. And yet God was bragging on his chosen king, David, over all of Israel. But that's not the only time that God bragged on David. When God was responding and reprimanding King Jeroboam. Now, there were two kings after Solomon died. The rightful heir was Rehoboam, Solomon's son. But then there was a rival, and that was Jeroboam. And God was reprimanding Jeroboam, and he said this. This is 1 Kings 14, 18. And yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. What David was God talking about? That he had kept his commandments and followed me with his whole heart, and did only what was right in his in God's eyes. That's a crazy, amazing statement. And this is not what I'm teaching on today, but it's a great reminder of how God looks at our sin when it's confessed and when we repent of it. That he looks at us the same way he looks at David and brags on us much like he bragged on David. Now, I think there's a key to why God can brag on David, why God can declare such immense truth over a very flawed man. After David's sin, the Lord sent him Nathan, the prophet, to confront him. And when he was confronted, instead of denial or excuses, David comes clean. And he says, Lord, I have sinned against you and you only. But if that were all we were told about this incident, we would have no idea of the depth of the repentance that David felt. Fortunately, we have Psalm 51 
which is a soul being poured out before the Lord with great transparency, with a brokenness of heart. And in that psalm is the most curious verse you read. Psalm 51, this is verse 8. And David says, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Wait. Why did David ask God to let him hear joy and gladness? Why not ask him, Lord, let me feel your joy. Let me feel your gladness. Let me experience your joy and your gladness. Let me sense it deep within. But David didn't ask that. He said, let me hear joy and gladness. And that captivated me, that word hear. And I went to the Lord. I said, Lord, help me understand why David wanted to hear joy and gladness and not feel it. You see, we are driven by our emotions. Most of us in this world are emotionally driven. We're driven by our soul's desires. We're driven by our flesh. We are not wholly driven by our spirit, but we're driven by feeling and touching intangible things. And that's what we want to feel joy. We want to feel happy. We want to feel gladness. We want to feel whatever. David didn't ask that. Lord, let me hear joy and gladness. Well, first let's look at what joy and gladness are and what David is really asking. Joy is something entirely different than gladness. Joy, in the biblical context, is not an emotion. There's a big difference between joy and gladness because gladness is emotion and temporary. Gladness is something that you feel that is coming and going. It can come and wane and come back and wane again. But joy is something that is spiritual. See, gladness is in the soul. Joy is something in the spirit. How do I know that? Because Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the spirit, which is joy. So joy is something that is spirit-led, and gladness is soul-led. Joy is an attitude of our hearts, where gladness is is an attitude of our soul, like our bodies. The term gladness tends to be broader than the term of joy. Gladness tends to include a notion of contentment and satisfaction, like I feel glad that I went to Florida. I feel glad that I had that pizza. I'm so glad you came to visit me. See, those are glad tidings, right? But joy suggests something more intense. It's a stronger sense in us than gladness. Joy is a permanent possession of gladness, while gladness, uh, uh, joy is a permanent possession while gladness is fleeting. Joy stays, gladness comes and goes. Now, by definition, gladness is defined as this, cheerfulness to be bright and to glisten all outward appearances, right? But joy is defined as a state of mind or an orientation of the heart, internal. Gladness is expressed externally, but joy is something on the inside. It is a settled state of contentment and confidence and hope. It is settled. It is a sealed deal. I don't have to pursue joy. I have joy. If I have the spirit, I have this unending joy. Now, in the midst of the storm, you do not have gladness. But in the midst of the storm, you have joy. Because the joy comes because you know that God will see you through the storm, deliver you out of the storm, or calm the storm. You're glad when you're on the other side of it. But joy is what gets you through it. The Bible is full of scriptures about joy. Let me just talk to you about joy for a second. Nehemiah wrote, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not gladness, joy. The psalmist in Psalm 5 wrote, For all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. 
Psalm 4, verse 7 says, The psalmist wrote that God put more joy in my heart. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, God, In God's presence there is fullness of joy. And in Psalm 21, God's presence will make him, I love this, he will make him glad with the joy of your presence. In other words, the joy can produce a gladness, an outward appearance of something that's already inwardly done. And I love that verse. It's Psalm 21, verse 6. He will make him glad with the joy of your presence. Now, why would David want to hear these things and not feel them? Now, the word hear is a really important and critical word here. To, to understand the word hear, I think, gives us a clue to why David asked for it. Because the word hear means to obey and to listen with the connotation of response. Now, that's a big set of words, basically, but what it means is that David wanted to hear joy and gladness because it required a response out of him. He was going to obey the joy, obey and listen to the gladness, listen intently, and then respond to what he heard. It's important to remember that the scriptures were entirely and totally written to be read aloud by their original writers. The word was always intended to be spoken. The words of the Bible were never intended by the original writers for everyone to have copies, multiple copies on their shelves. They were created so that one person could read to hundreds, and by hearing it, they could comprehend and respond to the word. I just spent a couple days at the Holy Land Experience in Florida. It was my second time there, and it was as powerful as my first. And there is a place called the Scriptorium, which takes the, it's one of the most amazing collections of antiquities and texts of the Bible. They, these are old, so old, thousands of years old, that, that they have pieces of them. And these reminded me that not everybody had copies. Only a chosen handful, a privileged few, had the ability to read and write. The rest of the world were basically illiterate. And so when David was writing this Psalm 51, he says this, I want to hear something. I want to hear because I understand that it's all about hearing. It's not about anything else. It's about hearing. So, of course, God took me to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. We know this. So then faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. This is what was meant by faith comes by hearing because that was the experience of every person in the Old Testament and every person in the New Testament. Their faith in Jesus in the New Testament and their faith in God came strictly and solely by hearing. They didn't read it. They heard it. When the word of God was preached, it was received orally in the ear by the various audiences. When someone read scripture in the synagogue, it was read aloud, such as when Jesus read Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. And the audience heard Jesus orally. When the inspirational letters from the apostles were sent to the churches by Paul and Peter, and James. They were read to the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church, and were read aloud and heard orally. We were at the Holy Land, I just told you that. And we had communion with Jesus. Now we understand that Jesus was just a costumed man and that he wasn't the real Jesus. But yet there was such a powerful anointing on this man, a call, a very specific, radically amazing call on this man. 
that when you looked into his eyes and he began to, to quote scripture, it came to life inside of us. When he prayed over us, it was like a stirring inside. Faith came by hearing the word. It didn't matter that he wasn't the true son of God, but he was an imitator of Christ, much like we were told to be. And because he was an imitator, he preached out loud. And we all, nine of us who went, all faiths were stirred. We had just this amazing stirring of faith. All of these instances the audience heard the word of God being spoken by someone reading the text out loud. From that hearing, they believed, and faith came to them as it was given to them by God. Jesus was very concerned about the issue of how we hear. Mark chapter 4, verse 9. Then Jesus said, He who has ears... Let him hear. It's almost like Jesus saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's like he's saying, be careful how you hear. And Jesus didn't just say this once. This expression, he who has an ear, let him hear, is found 14 times in the New Testament. 14 times did Jesus say, let him who has ears hear. Why? Because hearing, faith comes by hearing. Jesus insisted that hearing was essential to acquiring eternal life. This is John chapter 5, verse 24. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. He has crossed over from death to life. Let he who hears my word believe and cross over from death to life. Notice that out of Jesus' own mouth, the connection between hearing my words and believing there is not one, listen, listen, there is not one biblical connection between seeing and believing. There's not one, one biblical connection between feeling and, hear, and believing. There is not one connection be, between thinking and believing. There's not one connection be, between touching and believing. There is not one connection between smelling and believing. The only biblical connotation to believing is hearing. I believe that's what David was asking for. Hearing so he could believe. Believe what? Believe that as heinous and grievous as his sin was, he said, my bones were broken. My bones felt like they were breaking inside of me. The burden that was put on David because of his unrepentant, unconfessed sin was unbearable. He had a man killed. He stole a man's wife. He committed adultery. Name the commandment, David broke it. He bore false witness. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He committed adultery. He committed murder. You name it, David did it. And in that crucible moment, David felt dead. He just felt dead. Everything that he had had with the Lord was broken. Every fiber of his being had been wrapped because of the burden of that sin. And this scripture in John 5 said, he who hears and believes has crossed over from death into life. And I believe David needed to hear God speak joy and gladness. Because if you read the rest of that verse, it says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you, Lord, that's a capital Y, that you have broken may rejoice. I believe David needed to hear the Lord. Restore unto me the joy 
of your salvation. Also a capital Y. It's not our salvation. It's God's. And David needed to hear God's restoration of his joy in salvation. David needed to hear to believe that it could possibly be that he could be such a wretched sinner to become such a saint of God that God would declare over him that this is a man who knows my heart and is after my heart, who kept all of my commandments, who was right in my eyes. David needed to hear to believe. I have read Psalm 51 out loud many times in my life when I have felt like I have grieved the Lord and and I've sinned before Him. I open my Bible and I read Psalm 51. But then I read Psalm 34, which is the answer to David's Psalm 51. He then writes Psalm 54 and he says, Thou blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose transgression has been covered, basically. You see, David heard the restoring salvation and joy of the Lord. He heard God speak into him, Psalm 34. David cried out, God, speak something to me that I can hear joy and gladness. And then God sends him the words of Psalm uh, Psalm 34. How blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin has been covered and taken away. David heard joy and gladness. And through that joy and gladness, he believed it was possible. He believed it was so. He believed with his whole heart that he could be restored to the Father. Oh, that can be us. If we would just hear what God wants to say not try to look for it or pursue it or touch it, but let him hear. Let us hear what he's saying. I love the way Eugene Peterson interpreted the scripture in the Message Bible. I love the Message Bible. And Eugene Peterson just had this great way of opening up the word. And here's how he put... Now let me read Psalm 51, 8 in its natural. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Here's Eugene Peterson's The Message Bible. Tune me in to foot-tapping songs. Set these once broken bones to dancing. Tune me in to foot-tapping songs and set these once broken bones to dancing. Don't you love that? David said, I want to hear a song. I want to hear a song of joy and gladness in my heart. Now, don't you know that that David said that God sings songs of deliverance all around him? You see, David heard. David listened and heard the Lord. Can you hear what I hear David saying? Can you hear the joy and the gladness in your father's heart over you? Can you hear him rejoicing and restoring you? Can you hear the faith surging within you because you have heard God's voice? You say you don't know his voice? Open the word. You'll hear his voice. And read it out loud. I love reading it out loud. Every morning when I do my quiet time, I have an app on my, bi- uh, my uh, iPad called the Bible, uh, uh, Bible Is. And what it is is a Bible that's a narrative Bible. So I hear the word every morning. I don't just read it because faith doesn't come by he- reading. It comes by hearing. So I listen to the word every morning. I crank it up. I go through the entire Bible Bible in a year, but every morning I hear his word being spoken over my life. That's where my faith is built up. Can you hear him? Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what David heard? Restoration, joy, salvation, and gladness. David said, Lord, I don't want to see it. I need to hear it. And when I hear it, I believe it. And when I believe it, I cross over from death to life, from dark to light, from ashes to beauty, from mourning to dancing. I cross back from one to the other because I have heard. Oh, saint, listen for his word. And if you don't know Jesus, Please call us at the office. Get us online that we can lead you to him, that you might hear the joy and gladness that I speak about today. 
He's an amazing Savior, and He loves you desperately. And He longs to give you His voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They hear me and know me. We want you to introduce you to Him. Because He is painting this beautiful picture of your life with His, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Pfister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.